Welcome to Buggy One. This is our mobile broadcast studio here on the Tundra. In the back of the vehicle, we have beds to stay in. We've got a heater to keep us warm. We have a bank of batteries underneath the floor that allow us to operate all day long without running the engine. And we even have a bathroom for when nature calls. Here in the front is where all the action happens. We have our panelists that will be sitting here speaking to you live over the internet. Here's Elisa doing a little science in the front. Behind the panelists, we have the joystick and computers all working to produce the signal that you see today. And up front, we have the driver's seat. It allows us to move this entire rig to go find the bears. So hold on to your toques. Let's go for a ride. Okay guys, I've got a great question for you. Are you ready for it? What's a balanced diet for a polar bear? Any ideas? A seal in each paw. <laughs> I love that one. Okay, you ready? I got another one for you. What's a polar bear's favorite meal? Seventh graders, I hear you guessing. What is it? I think I heard that. Breakfast. Okay, one more, one more. Uh, what do you get when you cross a polar bear with a seal? Lots of answers. Maybe some good guesses. Yeah, a happy polar bear, of course. And speaking of happy, since these are unbearable jokes, my name's Kyle Schutt, and let's kick this thing off because this is Tundra Connections, and we're so glad that you are joining us. Again, I'm with Discovery Education, and I'm invited here by the panelists and the organization Polar Bears International that does amazing things broadcasting live events from Tundra Buggy One. That's where we are here, a roving uh, Tundra Buggy that's a production studio, and we're 
somehow in the Arctic Circle, basically being able to broadcast polar bears to classrooms all around the world. It's so exciting, and we're so glad that you're here joining with us. So to kick things off, we can start right next to me. Can you please introduce yourself and tell all the classrooms out there uh, what your name is and what your role? Sure. Hi, everybody. My name is Alisa McCall, and I work for Polar Bears International as one of the scientists, and I also direct our outreach program, so programs like this where we get to talk to adults and kids all around the world about polar bears. And I, I'm Dr. Steve Amstrup. I'm the chief scientist for Polar Bears International, and I'm fortunate to be able to join the panel today. Usually I'm doing less exciting things, like maybe talking to small groups or writing papers or things like that. And so getting to talk to you is a really big deal. I appreciate being here. Absolutely. And we appreciate you being here. We want to make this as interactive as possible. So as we go throughout the show, it'll be about 30 minutes here where we'll hopefully show polar bears. We've got one. You probably saw him already. He's in the willows just a little bit beyond our buggy here. He's just kind of taking a little snooze in the in the willows, in the snow. Uh, we've also had a mom and a cub walking by. We'll mm -hmm. see if they uh, they took off the other way, but maybe they'll come back. We, we can only hope so. Um, and so as you see those bears and as you hear what we're sharing with you, make sure that you submit your questions to the, either the inbox, questions at pbears.org. Again, that's questions at pbears.org, email inbox. Or of course, there's that chat window right below your viewer screen, below your video player. You can submit those there. And of course, we love to see what does your viewing location look like? How are you learning with us today? Use that hashtag Tundra Connections on Twitter and we will take a look at those as well. So speaking of all the folks viewing, guys, we have, we have a lot of folks out there today. In fact, I heard just earlier today that we have over 65 educators from across Louisiana gathering to learn more about teaching and learning with STEM instructional strategies at a special wow. event with our partnership uh, with Louisiana Public Broadcasting. So pretty wow. excited that those guys are together. Hi, wow. everybody. Hope you're with yeah, us. That's cool. We've got teachers all across Canada in Winnipeg, right? Out to Alberta. We've got teachers down in Florida in the United States, out to California. So more importantly, we have students that just, they can't wait to submit their questions. And we can't wait to answer them. In fact, we have a couple couple more shout outs because we, we kind of adopted your mascot. We hope you don't mind guys, but we, we just love this idea of flat nanook, right? Your little polar bear mascot. And I asked some classrooms and some teachers specifically in the Den Online community, hey, take a picture of yourself with flat nanook and we'll give you a shout out on the, uh, on the webcast. So here's our little shout out. I know uh, Wendy Norton's class, uh, Hugh McDonald. We had a bunch of educators here and you can see they're also using that, uh, that Twitter Tundra Connections. There's Wendy right there. And also doing some fun stuff with their students. Green screening themselves in, with polar bears in the background, so important. So we really appreciate you guys taking the time to, to share with us and we want to learn with you. So let's jump right in. We are talking about polar bears today. We have so much to learn um, and we hope you keep track of how of your learning with us and you can share back so to, to really kick things off where are we here dr. Amstrup can you describe a little bit about Churchill uh, here on the western shores of the Hudson Bay where Churchill is in Canada and a little bit about this Arctic ecosystem so Churchill is about 600 nautical miles north of the town of Winnipeg which I think is about four or five hundred miles north of Minneapolis so we're quite a ways north, and we're on the western side of the Hudson Bay. It's a big body of water, and on Churchill is right at the base of what we call Cape Churchill, which is a little bit of east-west coastline in a mainly north-south uh, protruding coast of the bay. So what this east-west coastline does is it tends to attract the first ice of the season, and we have all these polar bears out here. They've been on land all summer waiting for the ice to freeze up so they can get back out onto the ice and feed. And we're fortunate enough to be here watching them, learning about their behavior, and telling you about it uh, while they're out here waiting. And we're all excited about the sea ice soon forming up. Yeah, it's been magnificent. Uh, you probably saw in that little chat window before we got started. It's about 5 degrees Fahrenheit outside, but wind temps minus 13. So it's a little chilly out there. It might be cold for us, but it's perfect. It's becoming that polar bear weather, and that's what they love. And I'll tell you, the bay just continues to freeze. We can hardly see the, the water on the horizon, which is pretty phenomenal. Now, there's more than bears in this area, right? As we, these, uh, these middle schoolers, high schoolers, are learning all about habitats and ecosystems. We saw some other animals. Yeah. What did we see, Elisa? 
I saw a vole yesterday. <laughs> I was very excited. So they're a little small mammal, similar to a mouse. That's uh, They're an important prey species for a lot of animals around here, like the snowy owls and the arctic foxes. And so I got very excited to see one running across the snow. They're pretty cute. Dr. Amstrup, what else did we see? We, we saw... Ago. This was. This is the biggest of the members of the falcon family, a predatory bird. They also feed on those voles, but mainly up here they feed on ptarmigan, which is a, uh, a member of the grouse family. They're totally white except for a little bit of color on their tail. And so the jer falcons are up here looking for those ptarmigan, and we're up here looking for them all. Yeah, that's a ptarmigan they're seeing on the screen there. A really pretty bird just kind of blends right in there. Um, but the jeer falcon, that was amazing. Absolutely incredible. Yeah. I was so excited to see that. Um, now, we had a couple other questions about um, where we are in relation to, to the United States and where, where I come from, Pennsylvania. Um, and in fact, I figured out, guys, that I traveled over 19 degrees north in latitude. Okay. And by doing so, uh, in Pennsylvania right now, we have about 10 hours and 20 minutes of daylight, but only 8 hours and 32 minutes up here right now. Yeah. So for uh, your math teachers out there that are watching, I think that might be a, a fun problem. How much daylight, how much more daylight do you have compared to where we are in Churchill? Not to give homework assignments, but I like to give homework <laughs> assignments. So see if anybody can figure that out and, and share it with us using that hashtag Tundra Connections. Um, I have a question for you, John. Okay, yes. Yeah. Do, do they know how how many miles are in a degree of latitude? That's a great one. Let's put that to you guys. We'll come back to you by the end. Remind me yeah. by the end. We'll look on, on Twitter to see if anybody can share that. So how many miles are in one degree of latitude? Use that hashtag Tundra Connections or put it in the questions box. Kilometers works too. Kilometers, <laughs> yes, of course. We're yes, in Canada, yes. we're so in Canada. we really should use kilometers. <laughs> and to be Even. fair, that's more scientific. So that's what we should do in general. <laughs> um, all right. So talking about bears, I know, uh, Dr. Amstrup, you've just done so much studying of bears. Um, we have the, the polar bear kit here. Maybe we can bring those up. Up in a little bit too but we wanted to give all the students a little bit more background as to how far bears can travel uh, what their home range is even how far they can swim so we're going to take a look at this video called polar bears by the numbers and when we come back i hope that we can ask a, a couple questions of you to really get into the science because you've, you've spent your life your life's body of work studying these bears that's quite fascinating so let's take a look at this polar bears by the numbers the annual movements of polar bears are what makes up their home range. That's the place where they spend their whole year. And that really varies around the Arctic as well. In some places, they might only move around about a thousand square kilometers during the whole course of the year. In other places, they can move over half a million square kilometers. That's a lot of space. Some of those polar bears that cover a lot of distance in a year can walk over huge areas. For example, there was one polar bear that got a radio tag. It walked all the way from Alaska to Greenland, and then it walked back. Polar bears can be really good swimmers, and in fact, there's one study that found of all the females that they looked at in a population, almost half of them would swim every year at least once longer than 50 kilometers. Of these long swims that these female polar bears take, the average is even 160 kilometers, and it takes them four days. The longest swim was 690 kilometers, and it took her over nine days. Now that's a long swim. Even though polar bears are very at home in their water, their true home is on top of the sea ice because that's where they can catch a seal, and they need the seals to eat. That's why climate change is such a problem for polar bears, because it's reducing the amount of sea ice. The fact that polar bears are so at home in the water is just one of the many reasons that make them such an interesting animal. So I hope you can keep learning about them and maybe find out ways that you can make a difference in their life too. Absolutely fascinating to me. I don't know if you guys caught that, but there was some pretty, pretty astounding stats there. Uh, again, the, that body of research shared that over half the females would swim over 50 kilometers. The long swims being a trip from Washington, D.C. to Philadelphia over 160 kilometers. And the longest swim taking over nine days and 690 kilometers or 430 miles. That's a trip from D.C., Washington, D.C., all the way to Boston. I, you know, it's impressive. But I got to be honest, studying bears, Dr. Amstrup, it's a little scary, too. I don't think that's something we want the bears to be doing, is it? No, that's right. Uh, you know, I think polar bears historically have had to swim across open leads, uh, openings in the pack ice where they normally live and catch their sealed prey. Uh, 
nowadays, oftentimes a bear can jump into the water thinking it's going to swim just a little ways to find the edge of the ice and realize that it has to swim dozens or even hundreds of miles. And that one bear that swam, uh, that, and by the way, it didn't swim from Washington, D.C. to Boston. No, it didn't. It swam it an equivalent distance up yes. north. Thank you for clarifying. <laughs> <laughs> just, so, just so we're clear on that. Yeah. Uh, but I haven't that, seen any polar bears uh, in D.C. It, it took that bear nine days to make that swim. And in the course of that nine days, it lost a yearling cub, and it also lost 20% of its body weight. So although these bears can make those kinds of swims, it's probably not good for them. Most of the time, bears are walking around on the surface of the ice, and walking around on the ice, they are incredibly mobile. Uh, we've had some bears that had activity areas that were larger than the state of Montana. So you think about one animal traveling around an area like that is uh, is pretty impressive. Well, and we do have a, a map we can show because that's one of the things that the students can do on Polar Bears International website is follow bears with the bear tracker, yeah. and it's one of my favorite things to do. It gives you really that that perspective of how far bears can and do actually travel, and that's actually uh, one. Of, lots of the questions that come in are how do we study those bears? So I think this is a, a pretty great way to look at that, and I definitely would encourage classrooms to take a look at that after the, the web webcast as well. Um, we have more questions about how we study bears. In fact, there was a, a Twitter question that came in from Don Estridge High Tech Middle School in Boca Raton, Florida. This is Miss Mum's students, and they had a bunch of questions, actually. Uh, there was like four or five questions in this in this one image, and she had a little, uh, little bitmoji. I thought it was very cute, very clever. Uh, but there, these are all the questions, and you pick which ones you want to answer. So students wanted to know how close uh, the photographers get to the polar bears. Do they have to stay in a vehicle to photograph them? So I'm assuming they mean close to here, where we are in Churchill, of course. And if they're seen standing in the snow, will a polar bear chase them? And finally, do they use mounted cameras for up-close shots? So which one would you like to answer, team? <laughs> <laughs> well, we could start with, I'll, I'll take the first one, how close do uh, the uh, photographers get to the bears? If you come out on a tundra buggy, like the buggy that we're on now, you actually can be driving around in the midst of polar bears that are walking around on the tundra as they wait for the sea ice to freeze. And sometimes these bears will literally walk right up to a tundra buggy, put their paws on it, their front paws on it, and look you in the eye. And so photographers can be literally only a couple of feet from a real live polar bear. So that's a pretty impressive thing and, and makes it really exciting to be here. Yeah. Absolutely. So what about being on the buggy here and things like that, Elisa? Sorry, well, you have to remind me. I'm sorry, there are so, yeah, so many questions. Uh, just about, you know, being here, how close do you get yeah. personally while you're on the buggy? And then, you know, if you're standing in the snow, would they chase you some of that? Okay, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so when we are on the buggy, we're very safe, as Steve was saying. We're high up off the ground. Uh, some folks do sometimes see polar bears when they're maybe closer to Churchill, not on a buggy. And the recommendation is that you stay at least 100 meters away. And if you do see a polar bear, you get somewhere indoors safe uh, and just watch from a distance. Photographers have really good uh, lenses, and so you can zoom in on a polar bear so they look like they're much closer than they are. And if you are outside and you see a polar bear, uh, they won't necessarily chase you, but, you know, they could. There's always a danger with any wild animal, and you don't want to put the bear or yourself in that situation. So we always recommend people have shelter nearby and not to go out alone just to take pictures of polar bears and always be in something safe like a tundra buggy uh, where you're up off the ground and yeah, the polar bears and you can watch each other safely. Yeah, just like that guy we're looking at right there. He's just kind of, he looks so yeah. cute in the willows sleeping, but I don't want to get too close. Yeah. Um, Kyle, so, one thing ahead. I might add to that, will a polar bear chase you? One thing we know from not only polar bears, but other bears is if you did encounter one when you were on the ground on foot, you don't want to run mm -hmm. because they can outrun you. And oftentimes the act of you running will stimulate a chasing response on their part. So... They sometimes will chase you, and uh, you wouldn't want to be in that position. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, speaking of how we study them, we have some <coughs> pictures. You've done a lot of research on maternal den studies and things like that, and I think this really speaks to, uh, to how scientists work together and even giving the students some ideas uh, for potential careers and if they're interested in research. And there's not just researchers on some of these pictures. So I'm wondering if you can talk through a couple of the, the pictures here that, uh, that we're going to bring up as far as um, how you study the bears, how you weigh the bears, how you observe the bears in a, in a safe manner? So most of the time when 
polar bear researchers go out to try and catch bears and st to try and study bears, it involves actually catching individual bears and marking them. And we do that, you know, you can't just walk up to a bear and ask it to put on a radio collar. So we shoot them with a dart, a projectile syringe that we shoot, that we fire from a special modified shotgun and we shoot from a flying helicopter. Once the dart is in the bear, and within a few minutes the bear falls asleep and then we can safely ear tag it and put in lip tattoos and radio collars and things like that. And so that's one of the main ways that we have come to learn about polar bears all around the world. The pictures shown here are some uh, of the work that I was doing when I was up in Alaska studying polar bears. And, uh, but there's uh, uh, people doing that all over the world. Elisa has done that same work here in Western Hudson Bay. She might want to talk a bit about that. Well, and I'm wondering, Elisa, if you can talk to, I know we have a, a collar here, uh, and Dr. Nostrup mentioned the collar. If you can show them what the collar looks like, and then we also have some footage, because there was some pretty fascinating research done uh, with a collar camera uh, and following some bears. So can you show the collar, and then we'll get to that? Sure, yeah. So when we spoke about the bear tracker earlier, the way that we're able to follow those bears on the sea ice is by using GPS technology that's similar to what you might have in your phone or your parents might have it in your vehicle. So we can put a collar on a polar bear just like you put a collar on your dog at home. And the collar has a battery and a little device that talks to a satellite. And the satellite will follow that polar bear and the collar tells the satellite where it's going. And Steve and I can sit at home on our computers and download tracks and locations from the polar bears. It's very dangerous for humans to get out onto those vast sea ice areas way offshore that polar bears like to roam to hunt their seals. So by using this type of technology, we can really get a good sense of where polar bears are moving, when, who they're overlapping with, and find out things about what type of habitat they need and like things like where they're hunting and mating. So it's really critical information that we can get. And then, yeah, Kyle mentioned the uh, collar cam. So we occasionally, we haven't done this a lot, but in a few places it's been really informative. We've been able to put a little camera on a collar and get these short-term uh, kind of video sets of what a polar bear actually sees from its own point of view. And that can teach us so much about what the bears are really eating because of course data locations can only tell you so much, but to actually see with your own eyes what the bear is doing while it's on land is really important. And Steve, here we see this bear eating berries. Maybe you could talk a bit about uh, the, you know, why it's foraging for berries when its main food is seals on the sea ice. Yeah, there's a lot of people that wonder about uh, what polar bears might eat when they're on land and whether or not it really does them any good. And of course, a polar bear that's stuck on land for a long period of time, like three months or more here in, in western Hudson Bay, um, they're not just going to lay around and not try and eat anything. So they will munch on berries if there's any berries available. Sometimes we see them out here eating kelp or chewing on the grasses that are available sticking up through the snow. But what we know from studies that have been done over many years is that those foods, the berries, the grasses, the kelp, they don't have very much in the way of energy. Seals that the polar bears catch out on the sea ice, when the ice is there and solid enough for them to hunt, they're about 50% fat by body weight. They're incredibly full of nutrients and calories, and they allow polar bears to sustain themselves and to become actually the biggest bears in the world. These foods on land, even though a bear may eat them from time to time, they don't really do the bear very much good. And studies that have been done here in western Hudson Bay have shown that these bears are losing about a kilogram or about two pounds of body weight every day that they're waiting for the sea ice to freeze. Wow, wow, okay. Uh, well, I do want to come back to lots of these questions because we're getting a lot of them. In fact, we have some answers to your question uh, earlier about okay. how many miles or kilometers are in one degree of latitude. So, Miss Mum's class said 69 miles. Uh, Miss Franco's class said 111 kilometers. Are they anywhere close? I think that sounds about right because a, a degree of latitude is 60 nautical miles and a nautical mile is 1.1 something statute miles. So, yeah, it would be about 69 miles or 110, 112 they probably calculated yeah. 111. <laughs> I think they probably <laughs> have it for sure. <laughs> uh, 
Um, well, you know, these bears are phenomenal, and we're so, so thrilled we can bring this live footage to you. But of course, it's important to think about what we can do. And we got a question, because we know we have some students from Bozeman High School that are watching, and they submitted a video question to us. So let's go ahead and, and listen to their question. Okay, so our question is, other than the ice melting impacting polar bears' ability to hunt, how is global warming affect, affecting polar bears, and what are some potential solutions? So again, guys, that question is, you know, other than the ice melting and how that's affecting the polar bear's ability to hunt, how is global warming affecting polar bears, and what are some, some potential solutions? Elisa, can you, I know we have an a, a animation, a heat tramp, trapping blanket video to talk to, but what yeah. do you have to say there? Yeah, so the biggest threat to polar bears is the loss of their home, their habitat, the sea ice. And as you mentioned it, that translates to really loss of food. And when any animal loses calories and loses access to food, we do see changes in the population. For example, where we are here in western Hudson Bay, we've seen polar bears get smaller, have fewer cubs, and have their populations get smaller. And you've done a lot of research here on the western shores of Hudson Bay, so you've, you've seen that specifically to this population, although there are many populations. Of yeah, polar bears. exactly. The reason we can say that in this population is that we have been studying these bears for decades. So we've got these really long data sets, and we need to have many years of data like that before we can really look at any trends or any changes. So these are some of the very best studied polar bears in the world, and learning about them is going to help us better conserve and protect other polar bears and other parts of the world because these bears are teaching us so much about what happens as we lose Arctic sea ice. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, let's, let's just learn a little bit more about that, about what global warming yeah. is um, with, our, with our video here. Sea ice in the Arctic is disappearing. Why is this happening? When we burn fossil fuels for energy, we add more and more carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. Regular carbon dioxide is used and created by normal life processes, like photosynthesis and breathing. But rampant carbon dioxide comes from burning fossil fuels for energy. The excess carbon dioxide builds up like a thick blanket that traps the Earth's heat and disrupts the climate. Too much heat messes with the Earth's climate. A warmer world has lots of consequences. One consequence is a warmer Arctic with less and less sea ice. So what can we do? How, how can we help? Because there is still hope here for sure, right? Absolutely, yeah. The cool thing about Arctic sea ice is that we know that we can protect it in the Arctic and eventually get it to bounce back if we can stabilize that carbon dioxide in the atmosphere we can reduce it, stabilize it, and get that excess heat out of the atmosphere. So we're going to show you some examples of what people are doing around the world for polar bears. So it's important that we protect polar bears from being harmed by climate change, and this means safeguarding the sea ice they depend on. The key is moving toward energy sources like solar that don't add to that heat-trapping blanket effect. It's important we look for ways that we can all make a difference in our communities. Ask your school officials to set the thermostat up or down, depending on the season, by at least two degrees. You could even compete with nearby schools to see who can reduce energy consumption the most. You could talk to your parents and your friends' parents about getting designated bike lanes on more roads, or organize a bike bus to get kids safely to school and to camps without relying so much on cars. Many people are joining together in communities to do the types of things that use less of the kinds of energy that burn fossil fuels. Even in Churchill, we're running a couple of our polar bear cams on solar and wind power. So these are all steps towards safeguarding the sea ice that polar bears depend on, and it's the right thing to do for polar bears, for the planet, and for the future protection of us all. So it's not about any one person doing all the actions for polar bears but it's about us all working together in communities in different ways and relying on each other for support to cause change that's better for all of us. Absolutely, and Dr. Amstrup, what do you see? You've, you've been here studying this for a while and you've seen the changes. Uh, what else can we do? Well, I've definitely seen the changes. In, in my lifetime working in the Arctic, I, if you would have told me at the beginning of my career that I was gonna see these changes, I, I wouldn't have believed you. I think one of the most important things that all of you students could do is to write a letter 
to your senator, to your congressman, to your member of parliament, get your parents to help you compose a letter that tells them that you really care about polar bears and you want them to help preserve polar bears into the future so that you can see them for your whole life and so that your children can see them during their lifetime as well. Absolutely. And if I can add on, I would just say continue to find experiences like these. We know that through PBI's outreach efforts, you guys put on Tundra Connections every year, and we thank you for that. And it's a multiple-week program. We are uh, lucky enough at Discovery Ed to come visit you for one of these weeks. But you can go ahead to your website. You can tune in on those Explore Cams, right? And there's so there's Explore Cams all over that they can see what's happening in the world. And, of course, continue to, to research, right? We know that there's a lot of students out there that are using our Discovery Education and Science Tech book to, to learn more, uh, or any of our tech books, in fact, social studies, talking about these important issues for sure. Um, and then create create and demonstrate what you're learning with your parents, with your grandparents, with your uh, with your neighbors. That's really important. I agree. Um, so let's get let's get back into these questions because this is really I'd say it's it's not only an important topic but it's really hitting a uh, an importance here based on all the questions I'm seeing and we're getting a lot of questions so a couple questions for you guys Miss um, Clug and her class want to know what's the future estimate for species if CO2 levels continue as they are now so kind of a broad question but I'm wondering how uh, how we could answer that one yeah. Well, in 2010, speaking of the polar bear species, in 2010, my lab and I in Alaska projected that uh, we could lose two-thirds of the world's polar bears by the middle of this century if we don't take action, and that polar bears might disappear entirely by the end of the century if we don't take action. Now, polar bears depend on habitat that literally melts as the temperature rises. So, as it warms, there's a really direct relationship between the temperature and the bears. Other species, it may not be as obvious, but people have projected that thousands of species all around the world will be in peril if we don't change our ways and reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. So this isn't just about polar bears, but we can connect the changes that we're seeing in the polar bear environment pretty much all across the world. Well, speaking of, of uh, numbers, we had another class here, uh, Ms. Carrington, and they're in, uh, in New, West, New Westminster, and they asked, if polar bears are endangered, how many are left in the world? Do we have any idea of that, Elisa? Yeah, so polar bears aren't yet endangered, which is really good news. That's a label that uh, large conservation groups give them, but they are threatened right now by loss of habitat. So we do still have 20 to 25,000 polar bears left all across the Arctic, which means that if we do get our act together and make changes as a society, we can keep polar bears around, but we don't want to wait until it's too late because like Steve was saying, the ice is melting and it's going to take longer for us to protect that ice than it would for an ecosystem like, say, a forest where we could plant more trees or protect it with a fence. We really need to work on sea ice now to keep our polar bear populations healthy across the top of the world. Okay. We had, uh, another question here from Winnipeg, uh, Miss Brown's class, Miss Dana Brown. Hi, hope you guys are watching. Um, they wanted to know about how many bears do you see here in a month? Oh, that's a really good question. It's very variable. Yeah, um, and we've seen, I don't know, if we add them all up, just the bears we've seen today is probably 10 maybe. Probably, yeah. Um, so there's quite a few bears right around here. This population is thought to be about 850 bears, mm -hmm. and that goes from where we are here, right up around Cape Churchill, south for over 100 kilometers. And, but those bears are gradually moving north. Within the small viewing area we have here, I would guess that there might be 30, 40, 50 bears. Uh, but it's a, it's a really small part of the range that the polar bears here are using. Okay, and this, that leads into a question from Renner Skidmore who wanted to know, where is the most densely populated area of polar bears? Mm -hmm. Ooh. Wow, well there's, uh, there's some really high populations a uh, little bit north of us in the, the central part of Canada around uh, Resolute mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, uh, oh boy, what are some of the other, uh, some of the other far north places. Uh, there's, uh, polar bears in general, I'm hemming and hawing here because that's a hard question. Yeah, that's a hard question. Yeah, that's um, a great question. Polar bears in general uh, occur at very low densities. So um, the highest densities on the sea ice are still relatively low. 
One of the things, and one of the reasons they call Churchill the polar bear capital of the world is because the highest density of bears anywhere probably occurs here in the fall. And I've never really thought about what the, dense, the comparative density is in some of those other places in the north where there's high densities on the sea ice, but there's a lot of bears here mm -hmm. right and, now. And I think that's why Churchill's known as the polar bear capital of the world. They're so accessible here. All right. Mm -hmm. uh, a couple more questions and then we'll have to wrap, but uh, Ms. Spear joined us and she has some students asking questions. Specifically, uh, this is uh, Tyla at Moberly Lake School in British Columbia. Hi guys, thanks mm -hmm. for joining. Uh, how is it that polar bears can smell things from so far away? Lisa, can you share a little bit about their yeah. smell? Yeah, so polar bears have amazing noses, and I can demonstrate a little bit here, and Steve can add to it too. Uh, so inside their nose, which is long, they've got lots of, uh, what's, what's the correct word here, Steve? Some sort of membranous. Yeah. They've got a, a lot of surface area in their nose that picks up smell. So there's a lot of places in their nose where they can gather the smells. And then they also have an organ at the back of their mouth called, we call it a Jacobson's organ sometimes. If any of you have maybe a cat at home or you've seen big cats in the wild kind of open their mouths to smell, they can get air into their mouth to help them smell even better. So they have a few different ways that they can smell up to about a kilometer away, maybe a little more depending on how smelly the prey is and how the wind is flowing. Do you have anything to add? Yeah, I don't think I really have anything to add to that, except that if you look into the, the nose of this skull here, right in there, you'll see what looks like just sort of a bunch of pudding or something in there. <laughs> but actually, this is a plastic mold. And a real skull, that area in there would be full of these really small bony plates. And on each of those plate is a very sensitive tissue laying over the top of it like a really thin blanket and it's the, all of the sensory organs on that tissue that allows a bear to smell so well so if you compare this big nose with all those dozens of little plates in there and all that surface area to our nose not not a very good comparison so that's one of the ways one of the reasons polar bears have such a great smell. Mm -hmm. And I cannot remember what the names of those plates That's are okay. right we now. Can, we I better look that up for the we next call. We can give call. the students some research yeah. and some yeah. homework again. Yeah, we can you put go. it back on them. Yeah, back to <laughs> they can answer us using that time of question go. hashtag yeah. after the yeah. show. Uh, but I'll tell you what, that brings up some really interesting questions around the process. I think we have some students here that are interested in becoming researchers or scientists and knowing how is it that you study bears. In fact, this question from M. Carlton 071, what type of tools do scientists use to collect their data? Uh, and the suggestion, is it ethograms or field notes? What is it that you use? So maybe both of you can answer that because I think that's important if they are practicing scientists. Yeah. Well, there's all sorts of different tools depending on what questions you want to ask. So absolutely, everyone always carries um, some sort of notebook at least or a data sheet with them. So you're always taking notes about what you're doing and what you're seeing. That's really important that you have things written down. Uh, but from there on, it can really depend. So we showed some examples earlier in the broadcast of uh, the scales that we've used to measure polar bears. We can do things as basic as bring a rope and a measuring tape out. And we wrap the rope around the polar bear's chest and then lay that rope out against the measuring tape to measure the polar bear's girth. We also have a set of tools we call calipers that just measure the width and length of the skull and see how big the head is. And if we take those sorts of data from different bears over long periods of time, we get information about whether their body sizes are changing and information just about males versus females and all sorts of stuff like that and we can also take samples so we just have even little plastic baggies uh, with you know little nail clippers or scissors and we can take a little piece of a polar bear claw or of their fur and then we can analyze that in the lab and those things can tell us about diet and hormones and toxins so all sorts of the tools that we use uh, are really just based on what we want to know and then we have all sorts of technological tools as well that maybe Steve could talk about. Yeah, so, you know, I started polar bear work in 1980, and back then it was all written in a notebook. And we would get home and we had a big computer that we would punch the data into. And nowadays, of course, everything is far more sophisticated in terms of electronics. And most of you probably know that there's more power in the cell phone that you carry around than in those computers that we were using back in 1980. 
And that leads to a really important piece of information for all of you to think about is we, in order to get out here and really learn the most that we can from everything, all those measurements that Elisa was just describing, you need to have the skill to use those new sophisticated tools to record the data, to analyze the, dabia, the data, and to then present the data in a way that makes sense. So as you're thinking about how to prepare to become a research scientist, it's more important now than ever to learn those math skills and those computer skills so that you're really equipped to take advantage of what you collect when you come out into the field and catch a polar bear and weigh it and mark it and measure it. Mm -hmm. Excellent suggestions. Thank you so much, team. Um, I do want to shift to our polar bear survey, and Elise, I'm wondering if you can talk to this a little bit, because I just love that you're giving away these really cool coloring books. <laughs> uh, what is it that you'd like the teachers to do? Well, on your screen uh, below, if you are watching on our website, you'll see a little button that says, yes, I'll give my feedback. And we can also email out the link and post it in the chat box. We are asking teachers and anyone viewing to take our feedback survey. It really helps us develop better content and figure out what you want to hear about. If you do take our feedback survey, you will be entered into a draw uh, to win one of three cub adoptions. Maybe Kyle yeah. could pass me this cub. Absolutely. Yeah, so your class could win one of these cute and cuddly cubs for uh, your mascot or something like that. And you'll also get a link to download different resources, including this polar bear safety coloring book uh, that we developed for kids in Churchill, but I think it's interesting no matter where you live. You'll also get resources about the polar bear tracker and games to play, as well as some cool photos that you can use in different ways. So please do take the feedback survey. If you can find the time, we'd really appreciate it. Excellent. Yeah. And we really appreciate you joining us today. In fact, we have so many schools joining us. Just one last round of shout outs. We had Hope Elementary, uh, Elementary in Porterville watching. Thank you. Uh, hello from Ashboro, North Carolina, a fourth grade class with uh, Ms. Belote. I hope I'm saying that right, her class. Um, we had a class from Pasco County in Florida. Hi, everybody. We're so glad that you joined us today. Uh, also, Southern California, uh, St. Columbian School. Hi, Ms. Kalleis in your class. Uh, Ms. Brown's class from Cullicut School. They love PBI. They join often, I think. Uh, Maddie T12 said, shout out, please, to seventh grade. <laughs> All right, here's your <laughs> shout out, seventh grade. We hope you're having a good time learning with us today. Uh, and AD Rundle Middle School uh, would love a shout out as well. So thank you to all the schools that joined us today. And we hope that uh, not only did you learn a lot and you got to see some bears uh, in the wild, but also that, that you take the moment to know that time does still remain, right? We are all here to, to share the information about the polar bears and specifically about their sea ice habitat. And we can work together. Uh, lots of really good ideas that were shared today on how we can uh, reduce CO2 and save energy and really influence where our energy comes from. So if you're a student or a teacher, please visit uh, polarbearsinternational.org. That's their website. Click on that Get Involved section where you can find materials on how to bring about change in our communities. And finally, again, please consider completing that evaluation, that feedback survey that really does help us to uh, make better broadcasts and better programming in the future. So to wrap up here, we definitely want to thank our partners at Frontiers North Adventures that enable us to be out here on the tundra in these tundra buggies. Explore.org that brings you amazing images and Canada Goose that keeps us warm. And of course, thanks to each of you for joining us today. One last piece of advice, Dr. Amstrup, if I can start with you and come back, what would you like to say to the classes before we wrap up? I'd like to say work with your parents, your family, everybody in your community. Let them know that you care about polar bears and that they need to work hard to save them. That this is mostly about what we do what those of us do when we are living away from polar bears, it's not so much what we can do out here. So keep that in mind, get the word out, inspire people to make a difference for polar bears. Lisa? Yeah, uh, polar bears don't have a voice that they can contribute when we talk about this stuff, so we can be their voice and we can do what they need to keep their habitat around and that's good for them and it's good for us. And we're here with you, we're here to empower you and connect you with others that are working together and together we can make a difference.
Excellent. And my closing thoughts would be to continue to engage and learn in events like this. This event will be archived. You can go back and watch those specific segments that you want to learn more. And use that as the impetus to want to learn more, right? Find those things that really interest you and go down that rabbit hole of learning. And, and you never know where you'll end up. Maybe here on a tundra buggy one day. Wouldn't that be cool? <laughs> uh, I definitely encourage you to do that. So thank you so much. We had a great time answering your questions. Goodbye, everybody. Have a great afternoon. We'll see you next time. Thanks for Thunder tuning in. Big disgrace, moving your files all over the day.